Okay, so a summary of what we've been talking about so far. Uh, we have looked at the mechanism by which the central dogma begins its expression of genes, of coding genes, and this copying mechanism making the messenger RNA, which then gets sent out of the nucleus and goes to the ribosome and makes protein. And this section here is, of course, transcription. Now, there's a few things we have to understand before we get to the next step, which is where the RNA is read by the ribosomes and made into the protein. We have to take this messenger RNA and process it a little bit first. So we're going to study that first, and then we're going to get into the mechanism of this next step, the mechanism of making the protein. And then, finally, we'll get into the trait and what the uh, protein does to make the trait. So here's where we were before. We were in this situation where... Uh, the gene is copied, the messenger RNA uh, copy is made, and it's what we call the primary transcript. Now, there's a step that happens between the primary transcript and the mature transcript that ends up in this uh, area of the cell called the cytosol. They label it here cytoplasm. That's kind of an older term, which we don't use so much anymore for eukaryotic cells. The cytosol is just the fluid portion uh, that's on the inside of the cell. The cytoplasm is that plus the cytoskeleton. So, this step here, and taking the primary transcript and making it into a mature transcript, requires a number of things. One of the things that has to happen is that these endpoints on these uh, messenger RNA transcripts need to be stabilized. And the reason they need to be stabilized is because this is a nucleic acid that's going to go out into a very, very dynamic cytosol. There's lots of enzymes that can damage it, lots of enzymes and other species, with oxygen species and so forth, that can actually uh, destroy it. And so we stabilize the ends, make sure that they're chemically non-reactive on the one end here, this 5' prime end of the messenger RNA. Now remember, we're not looking at a double helix here because it's RNA. So we're looking at the 5' prime end of one strand here. And there, if you remember, that light-colored region right there is the part of the gene that is part of the promoter. So the begin transcription sequence is here. The begin coding region sequence is here in the dark green. Then the end coding region sequence is somewhere here, also in the dark green, and the end of the gene ended up with this AAUAAA. And remember, it got cut off. That part gets cut off when this whole process stabilizes and, and uh, uh, ends, when the process of transcription ends. So on the 5' prime end, what we have to do to stabilize it is we take a guanosine, which is the same guanosine that we saw before with one difference. It has a methyl group on it. And that methyl group is a very non-reactive group, which uh, is actually put on the most reactive carbon on that guanosine and makes it non-reactive. So it stabilizes that 5 prime end. So we call that a methyl guanosine cap. On the 3 prime end, remember, we cut the transcript off here at the polyadenylate tail, this bunch of A's here. And then another enzyme comes and adds a bunch more adenylates. It adds a bunch more A's onto the end of this transcript. And so we end up on the 3' prime end. We end up with what's called a polyadenylate tail or poly A tail. And that stabilizes that 3' prime end. All right, so that's the first thing that happens. We stabilize those ends and make sure that this transcript in the nucleus and then when it leaves the nucleus and goes out in the cytosol is not going to be uh, chemically degraded in any way. The next thing we've got to do, though, if you remember, the eukaryotic genes have these introns inside the coding region. Those are regions that are not transcribed. And the reason, I'm sorry, they're not translated. The reason they're not translated is because they get cut out in the messenger RNA. Now, if we look at this here, this salmon colored region right here is the promoter. And it says right here, this yellow is the start codon. That's actually a mistake. This really is just the beginning of the transcript. And so this yellow section right here is the portion of the promoter that is copied. Uh, and I'll give it a name here shortly. The start codon right, is right there at the beginning of that dark green. And then we have the first exon is this dark green here, and then we have a, a light green intron, then another dark green exon, a big light green intron, and finally the, the last exon. Now this is uh, based on the beta globin gene. If you remember, the beta globin had these three exons and two introns. And then this section here that's red is on the three prime end, which is the copy of the, uh, of the messenger RNA that goes beyond the stop codon. So here's the point. Messenger RNA includes the entire coding region. Start codon is here, the ATG or AUG in this case is here, and then the stop codon in the case of, of beta globin, it was TAA, is right there, but the transcript continues on on both ways. And remember, we have a methyl guanosine cap here and a polyadenylate tail here. Now, what happens though is that before this messenger RNA actually leaves the nucleus, or as it's leaving the nucleus is a better way to say it, these introns get removed, they get cut out. 
And so the mature messenger RNA goes from the primary transcript to this, where all of these sections, the exons, are spliced back together. Now the word to splice does not mean to cut. It means the exact opposite. Splice means to take two ends of a rope and put them together and make a single rope out of them. This is what is happening here. We're splicing this end of this exon to the beginning of this exon. So the end of exon 1 to the beginning of exon 2, and the intron is removed, and the ends are spliced like this. And then the same thing happens with intron, end of intron 2 and beginning of intron 3. So when you're done, you end up with a messenger RNA that is mature, ready to be translated, but much smaller, only about a third of the length of the original primary transcript. So what do these introns do? Well, we used to think that they didn't do much, but it turns out that we've discovered these introns are very important, and they're doing things that, in some cases, I think we probably don't know yet. But one of the key things that they do is actually help this messenger RNA get out of the nucleus and into the cytosol. And the process by which that happens has to do with these proteins, which have been relatively recently discovered. These proteins here, if you look at SNRNPS, is pronounced SNRPs. That's how we say it, and it stands for small nuclear ribonucleoproteins. Now, these SNRPs are attracted to the intronic regions of the, pro, of the uh, genes of the messenger RNA. So here's an example. Here we have an exon, ends in a G, and the intron begins with U. And then here, somewhere down in the, in the uh, intron, we have an, ad an adenosine, an A. So the intron attracts all these SNRPs. And why does it attract the SNRPs? And why, does, why do the SNRPs go where they uh, are, are attracted to and so forth is what you're going to study in your upper division classes. Just trust me, these things are attracted to where the introns are. Once they're attached to the DNA, or sorry, to the RNA in the intron, they then coalesce into a structure that looks like this. And the structure, which is made up of a complex of SNRPs, is called a spliceosome. And the spliceosome is going to do exactly what it says. It's going to splice these two exons together, which remember is to put them together and form one whole. But at the same time, it's going to make a loop out of the intron, like this, and then it cuts right there. It'll cut, in this case, right there at that G, takes the U, and then attaches it using this typical sort of bonding process that nucleic acids have and forms a loop with the U attached to the A by hydrogen bonds. And then it cuts here, right there, at the end of the intron, the beginning of the next exon, and then catalyzes the formation of a phosphodiester bond between the two exons. Then it releases from the messenger RNA, and it takes the loop with it, actually releases the loop. The loop can then, we know now, go and do various things. It can actually uh, uh, sometimes just get degraded, but it can also go and regulate genes. It can bind to other promoters of other genes and either uh, activate them, but usually actually inhibit at least the ones that I've seen tend to be inhibitory. So this process is the process by which not only the introns are cut out, but it's also the process by which the messenger RNA leaves the nucleus. Because what happens is once those SNRPs bind to these introns, they then haul the whole messenger RNA to the surface underneath the uh, nuclear membrane. They bind to one of the pore molecules, pore complex molecules, and at the time that they're cutting these introns out, they're releasing or pushing, appear to be pushing the messenger RNA outside into the cytosol. So the introns are cut out at the time that these, uh, uh, in, uh, sorry, the introns are cut out at the time the messenger RNA is moved into the cytosol. So there's a mistake in this picture. And this picture comes out of one of the older textbooks. And see, you can see here it shows inside the nucleus that the, that the primary transcript is made in the mature transcript and then sent out. And that's incorrect. This process here of processing the messenger RNA, making it the mature transcript, cutting out the introns, occurs as it's leaving and going into the cytoplasm. All right, so now it's time for the mechanism. What is the mechanism by which this ribosome actually operates and makes this protein using the information on the messenger RNA. That's what we're going to get into now. The interesting thing is that ribosomes don't exist in the cytosol on their own. In fact, the ribosomes are actually complexes of two different units, one big, one small. And I'll show you uh, somewhat realistic structures of that here shortly. But the ribosomes don't just sit there and exist in that cytosol waiting for a messenger RNA to arrive. What happens is this. The messenger RNA is in the cytosol and its uh, sequence attracts one of the units, the small unit, of the ribosome. This is true in both prokaryotes and eukaryotes. So what happens then is that this portion of the messenger RNA, typically upstream of the start codon, sometimes right directly on the start codon, 
will have a, a, a ribosome entry site or a, a ribosome site that uh, attracts this small subunit. And that is the beginning of translation. This is the initiation phase. But to make this, we have to attract all the other components that are required to get this process started, and there's a number of them. What happens once this messenger, or sorry, once this uh, ribosome small unit binds to the messenger RNA, it will either move forward toward the start codon or be directly on the start codon, and at the same time, more or less, again, I'm wildly oversimplifying here, if a transfer RNA that uh, has the correct sequence on its, what we call foot, binds to it, it'll stabilize the whole thing. Now let me explain that a little bit better. The transfer RNA looks like this, and it's got this loop at the bottom, which we call the foot. And the foot contains three, exactly three, nucleotides. Now those three nucleotides, in this case, are running from three prime to five prime, right to left, opposite the messenger RNA, which is going five to three. If it has the right sequence, which we call the anticodon, the anticodon is the complement to the codon, and in this particular case, the codon, start codon, remember, is ATG, which translate, transcribes to AUG. The uh, transfer RNA with the anticodon, therefore, would have UAC as its uh, anticodon on its foot. And since it's complementary and going the opposite direction, it, it obeys all the antiparallelism parallelism rules and all of that, it will come in here and bind to that start codon. It'll do that on its own. But if the small subunit is there, it stabilizes the entire structure here with three things, with the messenger RNA, the small unit, and the transfer RNA. And if it stabilizes it, and if it's there to stabilize it long enough, then it can attract a large subunit. The large subunit is much bigger, and it binds then to the whole thing, and now we've got a completely assembled ribosome ready to go. So notice the ribosome only exists after it has been attracted to the messenger RNA. The messenger RNA actually pulls it in and, and, uh, and forms it. Now, one thing about this particular transfer RNA, it has an uh, anticodon UAC because it is and it's the complement to the uh, start codon AUG. It turns out that there is an enzyme, aminoacyl transferase is the family of enzymes that it's in, that will read this small, this uh, little tiny anticodon and attach the correct amino acid to it following that dictionary that I showed you earlier. So here, UAC, what that enzyme does is anytime it finds a UAC, it attaches methionine to it. And that's exactly why it is that every protein starts with methionine, because the start codon is always AUG, and the transfer RNA carrying methionine always has the complement to AUG, UAC. So once we have all of this thing bound, we can start to actually build the protein. This is going to be the first amino acid in the protein. Now, this large subunit is really a complex structure. It's got a bunch of different sites, five primary ones, which you're going to talk about and learn about at some point in your career. Today, we're only going to do two. The two we're going to look at is this site right here. Now, here's what I mean by a site. It's actually sort of a slot into which the uh, transfer RNA can fit in the large ribosomal subunit. And that slot sits right over top of the codon. In this case, this site here, which we call the P site or parental site, is sitting right over top of the start codon. There's another site right next to it called the A site, and the A site's another slot, nothing's in it at this point, but it is sitting right over top of the next codon. It's called the A site for the acceptor, it means acceptor site. So this acceptor is sitting right over top of this, this uh, next codon down. Once that's set that way, we're ready to start transcribing, sorry, translating. So that's our initial uh, set of sequence of events that occurs here. Now, I just want to show you, this is a paper that was published a little over 10 years ago, and this is showing you in sort of more realistic uh, view of what this protein, so what the ribosome would look like if it were uh, large enough to be seen sort of with the naked eye normally. This particular ribosome that you're looking at here is a UK, sorry, prokaryotic ribosome. It's got these two subunits. One of them is a large one, which is 50S. S stands for Svedberg. It's a particular type of unit that we use to measure the, the size of these things. The 30S is the smaller unit. Now, this yellow, then, is the 30S. That's represented by this oval here. And then the 80S, sorry, 50S1 is represented by this big unit here. Okay, so what we have here, you notice there are these little slots into which these colored objects exist. There's an E site. That's one I haven't talked about. There's the P site. The A site's over here. These structures, these little, this green one, this red one here, those are the transfer RNAs that are carrying their amino acids. And the catalysis, the, the actual chemical events 
that are going to occur in building these, uh, amino, these amino acid chains, these polypeptides, that eventually become proteins, is really going to be controlled by this large ribosomal subunit. All right, so let's take a look at that. Here's, again, just a summary of the uh, initiation steps in this whole process. Here, you'll notice, is AUG. That's a start codon. And you notice that there is part of the messenger RNA that is to the left of the 5' prime end of the start codon. So this section here is part of the promoter that was copied. It's not part of the coding region. The coding region starts here and is this light green section. This section here is not coding region, so we have a name for it. It's called the 5' prime UTR, untranslated region. I've mentioned that before. And if you remember from that other lecture when I mentioned it before, there's also a 3' prime UTR. The UTRs are important. You'll study them in more detail later. What they do is they control how long the uh, messenger RNA exists in the cytosol. They control how rapidly it's, it binds to the, to, uh, the ribosomes to get the whole process started, and therefore it determines how many proteins are made. Uh, I'm not going to talk in any real detail about uh, any of that, but I do want you to know that this section here to the left, to the 5' prime end of the, or I should say upstream of the start codon, is this 5' prime UTR. Okay, now, if you remember the initiation events, the very first thing that happens is a small ribosomal subunit is attracted to this uh, messenger RNA. Now, in this case, they're showing it binding right directly at the start codon. There is evidence that that sometimes happens. There's also evidence that it will bind upstream in the 5' prime UTR. Usually, in reality, these UTRs are much longer, and they'll have a sequence that'll attract that small subunit called the ribosome entry binding site or entry site. Um, but this one is just showing it binding right directly where the start codon is. Then the next step is going to be transfer RNA carrying methionine with the anticodon that is complementary to this AUG. So therefore, the anticodon would be C A. Uh, sorry, uh, UAC. So here it is, UAC. Now remember, what end is this then? Right there. Well, since the messenger RNA is running five prime to three prime, this end to obey antiparallelism must be the three prime end. That's the five prime end. So this goes up into here, gets bound into here. How does that happen? It's physics. It has to do with the fact that this actually has these bonds that are complementary to these, these uh, polar covalent bonds that are complementary to the polar covalent bonds here. And they get attracted and are stabilized by uh, this small subunit, and it's ready to go. So the next step that happens then is the large subunit comes in and binds. And there's the large subunit bound. So there's we're done with initiation. This site, remember, is the P site. This site is the acceptor site, the A site. Now look, the A site here is right over top of this next codon, and the codon is GGA. Okay, now take a moment and look up what amino acid should be coming next. Okay, just take a moment to do that. And we'll pause for just a second so you can do that. Okay, so if we look at this codon right here, GGA, and if you were saying that the amino acid that's coming in is glycine, you got it exactly right. If you were looking at this and thinking that this should be CCU, remember that can't be the correct codon because that would be being read 3' prime to 5'. Prime. This has to be read 5 to 3. Just like whenever nucleic acid is built, it's read in the same direction, 5 to 3, so this must be the codon GGA. So here it is. The glycine should be the next one that comes in, and it should be carried by a transfer RNA with what uh, actual foot, what should be the anticodon. In this case, the anticodon should be read 3 prime to 5 prime, and it should be what, I, what we said earlier, it should be CCU. So we're expecting now a transfer RNA coming in with CCU that is carrying glycine, and there it is, CCU carrying glycine. Now what happens is this transfer RNA slides into this slot in essence. Uh, it's attracted specifically to this because this codon is complementary to the anticodon, and it's put right into the A slot. And when it's put into the A slot, then a whole bunch of stuff happens, but one of the key things is the large ribosomal subunit then catalyzes the formation of this peptide bond. Now you've seen this bond before. This is important. You've seen it a long time ago. In fact, you've drawn it. Here's an amino acid. Remember, we have the amine end on this side, the carboxyl end on this side. And to form that peptide bond, we take the oxygen off of this the ionized carbo uh, carboxyl end, and we take one of the, or actually two of the hydrogens off of the ionized amine end, and we form the peptide bond here. This is the exact bond that we're talking about. This is the precise bond that you've seen before. So this then is the bond that's being formed. And this is the key. This is really what this process is all about. 
we've now taken two amino acids and bonded them together. Now remember, this is, the, this is the way it works. The amine end is on the left, the carboxyl end is on the right. So this is the amine end on this side, and there's the carboxyl end on this side. All right, so now the next step is everything's going to move in the direction of the arrow. arrows. It's going to move from left to right. So when it does that, the entire ribosome moves exactly one codon to the right. So what happens then is this codon, the GGA, ends up slide, moving from the A site to the P site. The, uh, all this stuff that's in the P site gets moved to another site called the E site. I'm not going to talk much about that, but at the E site then a couple of things happen. The uh, uh, hydrogen bonds here between the codon, the anticodon the, of this initiator transfer RNA, the initiator one being the methionine one, uh, is, are broken as is this covalent bond between the transfer RNA and the methionine. So the transfer RNA then is released and the methionine is left connected to the glycine, but it's no longer in, at least in this particular explanation, it's not really part of the ribosome anymore. And so we see this, okay, we see this sort of thing coming in. Now look what's happening here. Here we have another codon, UGU. When this whole thing moves to the right, this A site is going to end up right over top of the UGU. It's going to attract a transfer RNA carrying ACA, and that ACA carrying uh, transfer RNA is carrying the correct amino acid for the UGU codon, that correct amino acid is cysteine. So the whole thing moves, and here you go, boom, there it is. So notice this got kicked out. Again, this is very, very oversimplified, but that bond here, that um, uh, covalent bond, between the transfer RNA and the methionine is broken, these hydrogen bonds are broken, the transfer RNA is released without its uh, uh, amino acid on it, so therefore we call this uncharged, it has uh, no uh, amino acid on it. And what else happened? Well, the, the uh, large subunit made this bond, uh, this covalent bond here, this peptide bond. All right, so what happens next? Well, we have the whole thing continues. What's going to happen then is moves to the right one more codon, this gets moved to the E site, these bonds are broken, this covalent bond is broken, this gets kicked out, a new transfer RNA is coming in, and since the codon is AAG, its anticodon is going to be UUC, and it's going to be carrying the amino acid that is coded for by AAG. All right, so and that amino acid is lysine, so the whole thing then moves to the right. Again, a new peptide bond forms here, and you can see now we're making this polypeptide chain. Okay, so it continues on. The next then is going to be CGA is the next codon, so therefore you're going to be GCU is going to be the, the uh, anticodon. It's going to be carrying then an arginine. The whole thing moves over. This bond is broken. This moves from A site to P site. A site goes here. It slides in the A site. You know all that. And now we've got this peptide bond, or uh, the peptide bond being formed. Now we have the polypeptide. Now normally this would be, if this were a protein, it would be continuing on for hundreds, uh, uh, potentially thousands of amino acids. In this case, they're just showing you a very short polypeptide. It's not a protein because it's not long enough to fold into a tertiary structure. But notice here, now we have this last code on here, UAA. Now, if you look that up on the dictionary, you'll see that that UAA is a stop codon. And you'll also notice that there's no amino acid associated with stop codon. And the reason for that is that there's no transfer RNA made with the anticodon AUU. The, instead, this uh, codon attracts not a transfer RNA, but a protein, and that protein is referred to as a release factor or a termination factor. The release factor then is attracted into the A site. Once this ribosome gets to, the, to this stop codon, it's attracted to the A site, goes into the A site, and it forms a kind of a torsion. It, it causes uh, mechanical stresses and along with some other stuff. Again, I'm not going to get into the details of this, but it causes the whole thing not just to stop, but the entire complex to do this. Boom, to explode. Okay, it's not really an explosion but the things fall apart. Messenger RNA is released, the small subunit is released, large subunit, that uh, transfer RNA, the, the peptide, and the release factor all released. So everything goes back to the way it was, except for one thing. There's something new here. What's the new thing? Well, it's this, it's this polypeptide. That's the whole point. So you see, these codons are translated directly into these amino acids. So that's the whole process. Now, you might be wondering what happens then to this messenger RNA? Can it do this again? And the answer is, yeah, it can. It, it'll go through this whole process again. And in fact, in prokaryotes, it can be doing this with more than one ribosome on it at a time. Eukaryotes don't do that, but prokaryotes can do that. And this can happen until this messenger, messenger RNA gets destroyed. Now, there are things in the cytosol that will destroy the messenger RNA. And so the messenger RNA only lasts, again, minutes to hours to maybe days. 
and the length of time that it exists depends on the sequence that we have here, which is not shown, the 5 prime UTR, and it also depends on the sequence down here, the 3 prime UTR. Now you're going to get into all of that detail when you get into your upper division courses and your cell biology and so forth, but for right now, this is what I need you to know. I need you to know the basic process of transcription and translation both, and I want you to be able to explain it to somebody. Get yourself to a point where you can explain it to somebody before the final without looking at your notes. If you can go through all of that, the, the, the uh, initiation phases for both, the elongation phases for both, and the termination phases for both, then you're ready for the final exam.